everyone. Thank you for coming today. My name is Lisa Fowler. I'm a volunteer for the Minnetonka Historical Society, and I'm here to introduce our speaker, Bill Jepson, which just by show of hands, how many people already know Bill? Probably quite a few. Yep. <laughs> so um, Bill is a, a retired teacher, and he taught both U.S. history and world history at the Dinah School District and then the Hopkins School District, and in fact was history teacher at high school uh, in Minnetonka when my son was there. I bet you didn't know that, Bill. <laughs> um, he has served on the board for the Minnesota, or excuse me, Minnetonka Historic Society for over 20 years, and I would say that's so far because he's still on the board. And for 12 of those 20 years, he was uh, president of the board. And for that, uh, we so appreciate all of his time and effort over the years. Um, he's talking today about Dana Freer, which is a very exciting topic because Bill has just um, received a grant, um, spearheaded by Bill, I should say, uh, and from the Minnetonka Historic Society um, to publish the manuscript for Dana Freer, which has been languishing for many years, and we're very excited to have it published. So I know it's like, woo, it's like long time in the making. So huge congratulations to Bill uh, for his dedication and sort of staying on top of this. Uh, so uh, without his efforts, it wouldn't be happening at all. So with that as an introduction, Bill. Thank you, Lisa. And welcome, everyone. Yes, uh, it's very exciting news. Yeah, we've got the grant from the Minnesota Historical Society just this last month, and we found a writer too. So I'm going to tell you all about that. Um, today we will introduce you to Dana Freer, Minnetonka's first historian, and his quintessential history of Minnetonka that's never been published. Here he is holding his. 350 plus page manuscript in his house next door to the Burwell house before his passing in 1975. We'll tell you about his life growing up in Minnetonka Mills and his struggle for 40 of his, almost 40 of his 90 years to turn his manuscript into a book. Along the way, we will share with you some of the detailed stories from his future book beginning here. Just as a prologue, I thought it'd start out with a couple of articles from long ago in the Star and, and Tribune, actually when it was the Minneapolis Tribune. And Dana Freer here was a PhD, a college professor, a Minnesota state agronomist, and local historian for Minnetonka. So in this article, Town Toppers, here's a quick look at Dana Freer. One of Dana Freer's greatest delights is to go calling on Minnetonka Township old timers and mine historical information from them. That information is going into a history on which Freer already has spent 15 years of research and which he expects to have in a book form in a couple of years. And then the article in the middle says, a publishing date is still questionable uh, it will cost a lot of money and involves considerable financial risk. However, it's comforting to know someone has taken the pains to set down the historical facts and fancies of one of Minnesota's most colorful areas. Um, he also has a hundred priceless pictures. And if we are lucky, maybe during this centennial year, we'll be able to read Minnetonka Town. That's the title of it, Minnetonka Town. So what year do you think these were published in the Star Tribune? 64. Good. 64, no, earlier. 1958. So he's starting to, he's been writing for 15 years, and he's starting to just get the, story, the, the word out through the Minneapolis Tribune. And then in 1964, that article says, a century and a half of history and 30 years of painstaking spare time research lie compressed in the 380 page history of Minnetonka town written by Dana Freer. It's the only history of Minnetonka that could ever be written, claims its author, because most of the sources of firsthand information are now dead or scattered across the country. But there's only one copy. It's typewritten pages 
found in a blue notebook and kept in Freer's home on McGinty Road in Minnetonka. So it, it starts, his history starts in 1803 when the present Minnetonka village was a minuscule portion of the Louisiana Purchase. The history ends with the incorporation of Minnetonka Township as a village in 1956. If the material is not put into print, Minnetonka will never have a suitable history, Freer said in the interview. Most of the people I got my best information from are dead gone. So 1964. And so I'm going to present this in three different sections. First will be Dana's life and family. And then with excerpts kind of sprinkled in a little bit from this, this book. And then Dana's endeavors to write and publish his manuscript from the 1930s until today. Um, and illustrated excerpts from the manuscript. So part one here. Dana was born on March 10th, 1884 in his lifelong home in Minnetonka. <coughs> The house had no electricity, indoor plumbing, or running water for many years. Kerosene lamps and lanterns furnished light, water, and water was drawn from a well with a hand pump, and chimneys in every room vented the wood stoves that heated the house. They built this house on 13212 McGinty Road using field stones cleared from the surrounding 160-acre farm. Dana recalls helping his father build the fence, which you can still see along the road, along McGinty, just as you go west off of Plymouth Road by St. David's. Across from the historic Burwell House, which is now on the registry, there's a picture of the Burwell House on the left. His father was Walter Freer, who moved to Minnetonka in 1869 from Pennsylvania, where he was born in 1846. This is the only photo we have of his father. It's a 1929 Minneapolis Journal article, which says, this is Walter Scott Freer, Dana's father, the oldest resident of Minnetonka Township. Here he is plowing in one of the fields of his farm near Minnetonka Mills, which he still does in spite of his 82 years. His father was one of the early township clerks. For some 30 years, for some 30 years, and his son thus got well acquainted with the township personages. After Dana married in around 1922 and returned to live in the family home, the house was modernized in 1928. When World War II ended, the pent up demand for new housing made it financially appealing for landowners to buy their property. So the Freer family farm was platted as Freer Acres and divided into lots. You can see it's here. And there's the Burwell House. Here's their property, the Burwell House, St. David's. And what's interesting is I was looking at the map and I see the Freer Drive is right here in the middle of his property for his father. And then Chase Drive will meet his mother next. She was uh, Clara Chase, and then a little cul-de-sac here called Dana Drive. I never knew that before. And uh, and here you can see the, uh, Minnetonka supervisors, W.S. Freer, chairman. And three miles west on Minnetonka Boulevard at Groveland Cemetery, Walter Freer was buried in 1937 at the age of 90. This is interesting because how old did Dana live? 90 years old. And as a way of meeting Clara, his wife, here's a little story uh, from the book. This is the Newark Hotel where Walter lived in 1869 on the corner of Minnetonka Boulevard and Baker Road today. Here's one of his old maps, Newark Hotel. This is Baker Road, it actually goes right here. And then the Burwell House is up here. Water Street is now Minnetonka Boulevard. But it's we have this one great photograph of the Newark Hotel. Uh, again, he was there in 1869. And the excerpt goes, quote, the large Newark Hotel boarded some of the mill employees. 
One of these was W.S. Freer, who had just come from Pennsylvania in 1869 to seek his fortune in the new country. He owned a pure white horse. I found a white horse picture. Named Flora. What a cool name. And rode from Minnetonka Mills to Perkins Corner in Hopkins in the early 1870s to see Clara Chase, who lived with her sister Julia, who had just been married to Edward Perkins. So the corner was called Perkins Corner, which I had never heard of, but it's Shady Oak Road and Excelsior Boulevard. So I, I thought, let's look at the map. So it takes by bicycle, it takes about 12 minutes to go from uh, his house to Excelsior and Shady Oak Road. So kind of interesting as he's dating her. So next is Dana's mother, it was an amazing woman, Clara Chase Freer, and his handwritten note on the back, Dana's handwriting is a little hard to read. You can see, taken 1896, Mrs. W.S. Freer lived from 1854 to 1937. Son, Dana, six years, and daughter, Arlene, two years old. From Early childhood, he was imbued with an interest and love for history of Minnetonka and Minneapolis from the stories told to him by his mother. She came to Minneapolis with her parents in 1854 when she was newborn. And then nine years later, she was orphaned along with her five siblings in 1863 when her father, Captain Dudley P. Chase, a Civil War hero, was mortally wounded at Chancellorville with the first Minnesota sharpshooters. So at the age of 16, she earned the first grade teacher's certificate awarded by the state to anyone as young as she was. She then taught school for a number of years. And after her marriage to Walter in November 1875, Mr. Freer, Mrs. Freer devoted her time to caring for her family in Minnetonka, where they lived. She took a deep and active interest in moral, spiritual, intellectual and political affairs of the community, waging an up uncompromising war against the tobacco saloon and liquor business, which she considered instruments of the devil. She outwitted the wets, they called them the wets one year, and prevented the liquor question from getting on the ballot in Mentonka town election, thus keeping the town dry for many years afterwards. She wrote many poems published in local papers and upon her death left behind many unfinished ones, together with trunks full of clippings and writings on many subjects. This is the great resource that, that Dana had for this history. She was a frequent contributor to local papers, in some of which she carried a regular weekly column, and ne never failed to promote all worthwhile community projects and to oppose unworthy ones. She also taught Sunday school at Freer's Hall nearby. Her children were encouraged and helped to go away to school and college. During the First World War, she made from her enormous file of clippings scrapbooks for the soldiers' hospitals, which were eagerly read by the patients. In politics, she always voted for the prohibition candidates or the Republicans in those days, as long as the latter behaved themselves. <laughs> when she and her husband went away, for the winter, she wrote many interesting stories of their trips for the local papers. Others, uh, if you recognize the name Chase, uh, others of their family include two members of the Supreme Court of the United States, Samuel Chase, and also a signer of the Declaration of the Independence, Salmon P. Chase, a Chief Justice Senator from Ohio and Governor of Ohio and also Secretary of Treasury under President Lincoln. And one more, Senator Margaret Chase Smith of Maine, one of the first female senators. Uh, they don't say as much, I didn't, couldn't find that, but I'm gonna tell you a, a lot more about Dudley. Chase as we tell the story because he was, anyway, I'll tell you that later. So um, Mr. and Mrs. Freer reared three sons, Henry, 
Janice and Dana, and daughter Orlean, of whom Dana survived. So they died quite young childhood, actually. And here is the dedication page, one of the first pages of his manuscript, to my mother, Clara Elizabeth Chase Freer, pioneer, crusader, poet, writer. She could have given him a great deal of help, uh, he said, because she was a correspondent for the review in her day, the review. He says she had a bushel basket full of, filled with clippings from local newspapers bearing her bylines. Here is her grave next to Walter and Dana in Groveland Cemetery in Minnetonka, you know, right down Minnetonka Boulevard. Her, and next to her father's grave, uh, next to her grave is her father's grave, Captain Dudley P. Chase, a Civil War hero. After being wounded at the Battle of Antietam in 1862, he rejoined his company as soon as he was able mortally wounded at the Battle of Chancellorville, where he lost his left arm and died a few days later in Washington, D.C. on May 8, 1863, leaving behind four little daughters and two sons back in Minneapolis with neither a mother nor a father. And I'm not sure why his wife wasn't there. So imagine Clara, Clara Chase, having no mother, and father at nine years old in Minneapolis in 1863 and having to help raise her five siblings by becoming a teacher at 16 years old. And as you can see, he was the first U.S. soldier to die in battle, buried in Hennepin County. So let's take a closer look at Dana Freer's childhood. Here he is part of, uh, here's part of Dana's one page autobiography at the last page of his manuscript. There's 380 pages at the beginning is the dedication to Clara and the very end is a few words about himself. The author was born on March 10th, 1884 in the house that he now lives in and where he hopes to live for the remainder of his life in his beloved historic Minnetonka, not, not far from the once beautiful Minnehaha Creek. This is the early, earliest photograph we have of him when he's six years old with his two-year-old sister and mother in 1890. Another photograph we have of him is in a, our Minnetonka book here, which, by the way, we have a number of them for sale afterwards if you're interested. You can become a member of the Minnetonka Historical Society if you do. I'll tell you more about that book in a bit because it's related to him. Uh, in this page from the book, he's the boy in the back uh, right here, and in this picture of railroad workers by the old Minnetonka Hall on Meha Creek across from the Burwell House. Here's another young photo I found at Minnetonka School in this group picture in 1896. And he would have been 12 years old. And he's right here, as he said, this is his typewritten, uh, you know, key to it. and. If you go four boys from the left, or from the right, he's right there. And then uh, he may be in this picture, but there wasn't a key to it. It's kind of blurry, but that's the inside of the Minnetonka School, probably on the same day uh, that they took that photograph. Photographers were a big deal then, so we have scarce few of them. Uh, and... Along with the book, he's given us another treasure, which is hundreds of photographs, which he collected over the years. And they're in our archives now. And uh, by the way, we're digitizing, scanning all our pictures and documents. We got a grant a couple years ago for uh, the inventory of everything in the Burwell House and our archives. But we still have a number, about 10 boxes full of things that we'll be scanning over the next year. We're, we're looking for volunteers who'd like to do that too. It'd be pretty exciting. Just talk to us afterwards. But uh, here's two, two good pictures from him. His good friend, George Burns, in a dancing class costume, Mr. King of Spades, I guess. And then this is a great uh, picture because it's so candid. Usually they're stiff and posed. Here's the Smith kids who live down the street 
eating homemade ice cream outside of their house along with some homegrown muskmelon in September 1898. And he, on the back of his, usually he tells you who everybody is, and he knew the names of everybody uh, in the area. Here are some children fishing on the Burwell Dock on Minnehaha Creek in the 1890s. This photo is looking north from Minnetonka Boulevard with the reflection in the water of the windmill back then. Perhaps Dana is one of the kids in the photo. And yeah, no, Minnetonka Boulevard, um, the Dairy Queens to the right. I'll show you here in a bit. And uh, yeah, I know they changed it as they did that, you know, many, many years ago. But but anyway, just to get oriented, you're looking. Now it's just the creek. It wasn't dammed up on the right. Uh, so here's an excerpt from his manuscript that I thought was interesting uh, about the creek. The early settlers were amazed at the abundance and size and variety of fish found in Mayha Creek and the lake. They were pickerel, which now called northern pike, bass, panfish, and bullheads or catfish. They contributed much to the food supply of the settlers and, and some income. In the spring, the fish went long distances up the side marshes into shallow water for spawning. Here many became e easy victims of the spheres of the fishermen when the game warden was not around, which was very seldom. <laughs> Each spring for about six weeks at spawning time, it was necessary to keep a man at the head of the flume leading to the mill wheel to try to keep the fish from reducing the flow of water and stopping the water wheel, which ran the mill. In spite of all this, they got in often, the fish did, requiring shutting down the mill. The fish were then shoveled out about two wagons loads each time. All the families in, in the neighborhood had fish, all the fish they could eat for a week about until they went bad. A favorite way to catch bullheads in the creek was to fish from the railroad bank bordering the creek opposite the Burwell home, a long bamboo pole and a line baited with a piece of salt pork tied to the end of the line where were used. No hook was needed. When the bullhead grabbed the bait, he would be jerked out of the water high into the air. The fish would let go of the bait and land in the bank behind him in a big pile. All the fishermen had to do was to throw in the baited line and jerk the fish up in the air and, uh, and then take the pile of fish home. So different than today, and one more creek story as we're talking about his childhood, um, there was a swimming hole, quote, in Mayha Creek, about six feet deep above the dam. This made a fine swimming hole for the boys and also on certain occasions for the girls when they dared to go in bathing there. The usual boy's shack was erected nearby with a stove. It was used as a dressing room for changing into blue overalls or pants with the legs cut off, which were worn by the boys who did not go in on natural. <laughs> One day when the girls were using the shack for dressing, they built a fire and some of the mischievous boys sneaked up and laid a board over the top of the stovepipe sticking out of the roof to try and smoke the girls out in a hurry. Deshabille, it's a new word I never, deshabille, I guess means partially clothed in French. They were soon discovered and scared away before any damage was done with such diabolical plots. Great stories. Uh, in those pictures, I just, I found generic pictures. Yes, sir. Oh, the dam is right here at Plymouth Road, and um, I did a presentation on the mills last year, and it's online. You can see it goes into the whole history of five different mills, starting lumber and then four flour mills between 1851 and 1892, and they're all at Plymouth Road. If you go to the little park to the east of that with the pavilion, there's a look at that sign there. It'll tell you here it was, and... Um, so everything was backed up there, and you could actually get in a boat and go all the way to Lake Minnetonka from there with a little steamer, a uh, small boat. And so I'll tell you more about that. Good question. So 
Here is a, another example of Dana's handwriting identifying everything in the photo in the 1890s of Burwell Estate from the south side of the creek. And his, it's this one of the problems uh, is his handwriting is less than legible, but uh, some people were really good at reading it. His wife and Betty Johnson, who I'll tell you about later, the Minnetonka historian. Uh, but it says, windmill, left to right, the house before trees got large, workshop formerly mill office moved here after the mill closed, 1884, became the garage, the farm barn, and this is the only pictures we have of, there was a huge barn in that clearing behind there. Uh, there have been times when we thought, oh, we should rebuild that barn, it's, it's part of the property, and, uh, but and we saw the price tag, many hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it didn't go from there, but maybe someday. Right background, uh, the Freer House, which you can kind of see way back here, and then uh, a fence to keep the ponies fenced in. <laughs> so that was standing here on Minnetonka Boulevard today looking at the Burwell House, and if you took a look to the right, you would see the mill that you just were asking about. And you see how it's all dammed up here. So the flume was here and the water wheel, which ground the flour and before that the lumber. And, uh, but also it shows the Freer store, which I'll tell you about, and the blacksmith shop. I'm just kind of giving you an idea. His little world uh, when he was growing up and uh, they had this general store from 1892 to 1900, built in 1877 by their friend, um, but he bought it in 1890, 80, 1891, Walter S. Freer did. And so this is another reason why Dana's history is so compelling, because he had all the stories. Everybody, all the farmers had to go get their goods at the Freer General Store. There were only a couple hundred people in Minnetonka at the time. And, and so they would all come there and it served, it served as a town hall, post office, and also a dance hall for many years. There's two stories high with hitching posts for horses. And this is Bridge Street. If you look down, that's the creek, Bridge Street, and that's St. David's School, where my grandson goes, right there. So since their store was on the creek where the lumber and flour mills were built three miles east of Lake Minnetonka, they knew about everything that was going on through those early decades because they sold the tools and food supplies. It was a hub of transportation between the Twin Cities and the vacation destination of beautiful Lake Minnetonka. So um, the, they would follow the road at first and then later trains and trolley cars. At the same time in the late 19th century, thousands of tourists would ride the steamboats up the Mississippi River in the summer to burgeoning pioneer mill town, Minneapolis, and then ride a buggy or a train to Minnetonka Mills. And looking at the, looking east on Minnetonka Boulevard, about 1897, you have this great photograph from all, from Dana. Uh, shows the black smith, blacksmith shop of Torleaf Larson on the bank of Minnehaha Creek near the bridge uh, over here. A, sh a shed of the mill company used for storage of machinery and uh, then the steer uh, W.S. Freer store from the other angle, and I love it. There's this dog. There were long exposures back there in 1897. So there's a buckboard and a dog that were moving. Another buckboard way down there. And there already had been this new bicycle path. It was a big thing, bicycles, uh, you know, in the, eight, in the 1890s with the new invention, but then it went away for many years until the 70s until uh, Betty Johnson started the trail system in Minnetonka, and now they took the railroad line and turned it into a bike path. Um, 
and it went from all the way from Minneapolis to Highway 101. And here's what it looks like today, of course. The Dairy Queen and Station Pizza is right where the Freer store and the blacksmith shop were. Uh, and here's also some bicyclists uh, in the late 1890s at the town pump. Uh, and so the pump is prob was probably right around where the mailbox is. And the Freer grocery was also moved in 1906 later. They, in the winter, they took everything down and then rebuilt it on uh, Minnetonka Boulevard and M Maplewood Road, kind of by Cowan's Corner, past Spazos, way west on Minnetonka Boulevard towards the lake. And I'd like to mo know more about why they did that, I think, because the mill had broken down and, and they were closer to the lake and all the action there. A couple things about the grocery store. This is not them. It's a, it's a generic picture, but but they have some notes and a, and a uh, sales slip from the first store here. But an excerpt says, many early settlers rode horseback or walked to the grist mills on Mayha Creek or elsewhere, carrying heavy sacks of wheat, rye, buckwheat, or corn on their backs for grinding into flour or meal. When they rode horseback, they laid the sack divided in the center over the horse's shoulders in front of the saddle or rider. They used the Indian trails or took a course as directly as possible through the woods. There were ro few roads in the town then. The women often made these tiresome trips because the men were busy clearing their land or doing the farm work. Minnetonka had the only post office and store in this general area for many years, and settlers came there to get their mail and to their trading, bringing with them farm products and other materials they could sell or trade for store goods. Butter, eggs, honey, cranberries, maple syrup, sorghum, fish, game, hides, pork, beef, mutton were some, were some of these products. Some settlers made chairs and brooms. The local grocery store was often the gathering place of the town politicians and loafers sitting around the stove. Besides setting the grave problems of the day, they often played cards or shook dice for the drinks of apple cider or pop. They chewed tobacco vigorously and swore like troopers. One of the boys was once the loser in shaking dice and had to retreat or had to treat the others because he lost. He said to Mr. Freer, give the boys their drinks. My face is good for them, isn't it? Mr. Freer replied, it is if you leave it here. <laughs> he had to pay cash. Uh, like all country stores, the Freers carried a great variety of goods, uh, groceries, dry goods, hardware, feed and drugs, kerosene for lamps and oil stoves was bought in 50 gallon barrels and pumped out into one or five gallon measures for pouring into the customer's cans. Gasoline was kept later in a padlocked barrel outside for those with gasoline stoves or for dry cleaning. Question. Question, yes. How did Minnetonka go from the first post office to no post office? Because <laughs> uh, we were in Hopkins, yeah. It's confusing for me. I've lived for 30 years. And uh, it's just as geography and logistics, I think. But I, I don't know the answer to that. But yeah, it was here, and then it was at the Minnetonka Hall when they built that around 1908 or something like that. But uh, good question. Uh, most families in the early days kept on hand a supply of the common remedies, but depended more on right living and hard work to keep them healthy and only called in the doctor in case of an extreme emergency. With no hospitals, the sick were cared for in their homes, often with the help of, their, of the neighbor women and girls. In the case of contagious diseases, the houses were quarantined, very interesting, uh, with large colored placards tacked on the house by the town clerk in a conspicuous place warning people to stay away. So, okay.
that's all his childhood and the store and all that. Now let's talk a little more about his middle age. Uh, Dana Freer graduated from the University of Minnesota in 1909 with a BSA. And in 1915, he received his Master's of Science degree. He worked on his course for a PhD degree from 1925 to 1930, and he was a teacher in the Minneapolis public school system for a hundred, or for a number of years, sorry, for a number of years. He taught and did research and extension work at Colorado State University. I tried to get the logos for these. North Dakota Agricultural College, the University of Minnesota, the University of Missouri, and Iowa State. He was named an honorary historian of the city of Minnetonka upon completion of the book, History of the First Hundred Years of Minnetonka Town. For 22 years, he was a member of the Minnesota State Department of Agriculture, and after 20 years of service, he retired as Minnesota State Agronomist in 1954, the year I was born. He was author or co-author of several publications on botany and wrote many articles for publications all over the country. Uh, he was also a charter member of the Hennepin County Historical Society, serving as vice president and president in the late 1940s. Here's a picture of him uh, right here. And this is the Hennepin County Historical Society next to the Art Museum, Minnesota Institute of the Arts. Uh, later, as its historian, he fought for additional funds to further the society. This is now Grace Smiley Freer, his first wife. Uh, she was a home economics professor at the University of Minnesota, whose son, shown here, was Graham Stanton Freer, an English professor emeritus at San Olaf in Northfield, Minnesota. And we'll meet him a little bit later. Dana and her were living at the Freer homestead for four years when she tragically died of illness in 1936, it says in this obituary, leaving 14-year-old Stan to live at the Burwell house for several weeks. More about him later. Later you will see how he played a role in the process of getting the manuscript ready for publication. And uh, this other gal, a lady here is Mary Graham Smiley, Dana's first mother-in-law, so uh, Grace's mother. And so she is buried in uh, Groveland, also next to Dana. A picture of Dana and Anne. This is a good color, the only color picture we have of them in 1967. And so here's Dana and his wife, Anne, who he married in, in uh, Actually, we aren't sure when exactly they got married, but sometime probably in the 40s. Uh, Mrs. Ann Helena Freer was born in Grand Forks, North Dakota in 1895. She was a former teacher in Minneapolis and a secretary at the state capitol. She also was a member of both the Hennepin County Historical Society and the Minnetonka Historical Society and lived in Minnetonka for 40 years. And, and helped Dana greatly with his manuscript and handwritten notes. She was a good typer, so as the work got underway, uh, it, the book occupied most of their spare time for decades. And after Anne became ill, his sister-in-law, Alexandra and Dagny, uh, helped with the typing and proofreading. Anne and Dana lived for the rest of their days in the Freer home on McGinty Road. And here's an interesting fact. They died on the very same day, January 28th, 1975. She died at 9.15 a.m. and he died at 5.10 p.m. She was 80 and he was 90. They're buried together with much of their family in Groveland Cemetery. There's well, it's privately owned now. Uh, the fence is still, the stone fence is still there. So I don't know. I have, you know, I have to go look or go out to the door and talk to them sometimes, I suppose. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, here are Dana and his good friend and neighbor, Louise Burwell, in a 1960 article about the manuscript. And here she is waving from the house when it was painted white there before she passed in 1967. And she sold it to the Smith family, who were there for many years, and then it was sold to the, uh, to the city, and then it became a historical, uh, on a historical landmark list. By 1960, Dana and Louise Burwell were the two oldest native-born residents still living in Minnetonka Mills. At, at 76 years old and 90 years old, he outlived her by eight years when he was 90 in, in 1975. And yeah, there's the dog, which is in the museum now. I traced that back to Italy when I was taking my students into the Vatican Museum. There's the dog right there, the exact same one. And it turns out it was a gift from friends who had gone to Italy and made a copy of it um, to the Burwells. But I digress. Uh, here, Dana and Ann are at a 25th anniversary program at Burwell School with Louise Burwell and her brother George. That's Louise and George and Ann and Dana. They had this 25th anniversary where uh, they all spoke and talked about the history of it. So we have those records. Those have been really helpful as well. And here's Louise dedicating uh, St. David's Episcopal Church, which she donated the land for in the 1950s. And uh, I, we weren't sure who this wedding was. It turns out it was the Quams, but here's Louise and Dana. There too. The Quams uh, used to own the Glens grocery gas station for, for many decades. Uh, Louise helped Dana out with many important facts about the Burwell family and her various, her father's various jobs at the mill and the family history in her house, which is now listed as a historic building. Here is a, a young photo of Charles Burwell, which you may not have seen before. Uh, and later sitting on the left here in the picnic right in front of the uh, Burwell house in, I think, 1898. And so the Freer house would be right through the woods here in the distance. And this is Mary Dunham, who is his second wife after his first wife passed. And the whole Burwell clan here. Um, and so here's an excerpt uh, from the book on the Burwells. In 1874, Mr. Charles Bur H. Burwell arrived to be mill manager. He was a widower and lived first in the Minnetonka Hotel. In 1876, he married Mary Dunham. His children's son, uh, son George and daughter Anna joined them in 1877 and they continued to live in the Minnetonka Hotel until their new home was built in 1883. The hotel had a front porch just high enough for the farmers coming to the mill to feed their horses uh, as they ate oats at noon time. It greatly distressed Mrs. Burwell to have her front porch used as a feed box for horses. So when Mrs. Mr. Burwell was planning their new house, she asked him not to have a front porch. The front porch was added many years later after the mill closed. Uh, part two, Dana's endeavors. So now let's tell you the story of Dana's endeavors to write and publish his manuscript. And I'll start out by going back to these three of these many articles, but uh, and some other quotes from them uh, in the Star and Tribune, or the Tribune back then, 1958. Uh, Tonka historian wrote history and lived it. Gathering historical data is a time-consuming and costly procedure. Mr. Freer, an inspired and self-appointed historian, has done all the research on his own time and at his own expense, except for an annual stipend from the village government. His agile and probing mind gives the task a lively flavor. He says he has traveled far and written hundreds of letters, gathering material for the book now, hearing 
uh, nearing completion, which he has named Minnetonka Town. 1958, Town Toppers, his own research work is paid out of his own pocket. It's occasionally laborious work. And then Tonka ponders rights to history. Ponders rights to history of village. So here it gets into it. Uh, there were some uh, uh, disagreements with the, the city and the money he was getting. Quote, I'll feel the village was, has a vested interest in Mr. Freer's manuscript and historical relics. He has received about $1,750 in public funds over a period of years, which he has used to help defray the cost of compelling and compiling the village history. They asked if Mr. Freer could die without making provision that the village receive what they have paid for, what then? Mr. Freer's manuscript and pictures could be destroyed by fire. Might it not be wise to store the valuable relics and pictures in a fireproof vault? The councilman wondered. Mr. Freer would be very unwilling to part with his lifetime efforts at this point. He, uh, added, he added that Mr. Freer might be willing to agree to a plan which would protect village rights. It was decided by Carl Dever, the village attorney, prepare that agreement and the council would ask Mr. Freer to sign it. Until that is settled, apparently we will receive no more funds. He will receive no more funds. So they wanted a, a, an agreement signed by Mr. Freer, and they stopped paying him. So, uh, another quote, Freer has fought unsuccessfully, this is in 64, he's fought unsuccessfully for over, for a year for the publication of the manuscript he finished in 1963. It took at least 10,000 hours of his time and several hundred dollars of his personal funds to gather and write, according to Freer, and now he's financially unable to publish his book himself. To gather the historical information, Freer traveled since 1933 anywhere in the country where he could find original Minnetonka settlers and their immediate descendants. Along with remembrances and anecdotes, he collected more than 300 pictures of persons and Minnetonka scenes to illustrate his book. Freer went to the township board and later the village council for financial help in compiling his history. He received sums ranging from $250 to $500 per year for nearly 10 years, but the funds were cut off, as said in that previous article, in 1962 because the council could not appropriate them, quote, for something from which we receive no services or benefits, a village official explained to a resident. Uh, Dana Freer's 380, here's a picture of it, a manuscript titled Minnetonka Town, the first hundred years, uh, as it languished for many years. Dana gave a copy to the Hennepin County Historical Society where Dana was a past president in the 1940s, and another copy to the Gale Library of the Minnesota Historical Society, and another copy was held is held at the Minnetonka Historical Society, where he was the president, longtime member, honorary member, and another by Betty Johnson, the founding president of Minnetonka Historical Society. Betty Johnson, this was when she was running for the city council because she was the first uh, female city councilwoman of Minnetonka and served for many years on several city boards and commissions. Um, and Betty, as board member of the Minnetonka Historical Society for many years, and the official Minnetonka historian, was the keeper of a copy of the manuscript from Dana's passing in 1975 until her passing just a couple years ago in 2018. She had tried to transcribe and edit it herself for many years off and on, and always tried to promote its publication. 
Elizabeth Betty Johnson moved here from out east in the 1950s and lived near the Burwell House on March Circle with her husband, Robert Johnson, who's still alive. Notably, she was the first woman to be elected to the council. She and Dana Freer were very good friends, and she spent many hours translating his handwritten notes as she endeavored to help get this manuscript ready. Uh, oh, and in 2001, along with me, she authored the uh, history of Minnetonka Mills, this book here for publication. We made about 2,000 copies. I have about 700 left or something like that. I just did the picture. She did all the the writing. Uh, I found and selected and edited pictures from the archives. Uh, here you can see her dedication of the book to Dana Freer on the back page, uh, or at the beginning actually. Dedicated to the memory of Dana Freer, 1884 to 1975, who encouraged the interest of many people of all ages in the history of Minnetonka. When she passed, uh, in 2018, she passed on much of her letters and documents to the Minnetonka Historical Society. When Dana and Ann Freer died uh, in 1975, a copy of the manuscript was also in the hands of their son, Graham Stanton Freer. Remember, Stan's mother was Dana's first wife, Grace Smiley Freer, before she died in 1936 when he was 14. And... He is the professor emeritus of English at St. Olaf for most of his career. So Betty knew him through his father, and so they exchanged letters around the year 2000 as she was writing this book. Uh, she asked for his memories of Minnetonka. And here, quote, Dear Betty, this is Graham Stanton for her talking, what a pleasure to get your letter and news of Minnetonka. And, of course, memories of my father, from whom I probably heard more local history than I could ever remember and at the time little appreciate. But now I realize that he was deeply immersed in his roots and had become part of the very history he spent years pulling together. I also have a manuscript copy of his history. I would be more than happy to give permission for my dad's history to be resurrected and edited into something a bit more finished. Although, there, although dad was thorough, and perhaps thoroughness is essential in such a history. It would be great to have the history in print, and I would think a fair amount of interest would be generated if it were to appear. So this is in the year 2000. You would be most welcome here, and we could have a good talk about times past. Graham Fear was uh, not only a professor, uh, earned his graduate degree from the University of Minnesota and joined the St. Olaf faculty in 1862. In addition to English education, Freer, Dana's son, taught rhetoric and American literature, offered the first course focused on African American literature and founded uh, St. Olaf's Irish Studies program and published two books of poetry. So he gave permission through Betty Johnson to get his father's manuscript done. And so next step, uh, many board members of the Minnetonka Historical Society have been helpful in moving Dana's manuscript towards publication. When I started my 12 years as president in 2007, one of my first goals was to get it published. And the current president, Jan Cook, uh, right here in the middle, is continuing to move towards that goal. For many years, we didn't get very far in the first steps of transcribing the 388-page manuscript, which was only typewritten on paper in the notebook. But the, vo the volunteer work went slowly until last year when we discovered that Wyzetta High School program, where they had uh, seniors who were delighted to earn points by typing, you know, being a volunteer. So they typed away for a couple of months, and and we're very helpful in doing that for us. This is uh, the old board from 10 years ago or so. Lawrence Bogle, Chuck Donnelly, Joe Van Sloan, Jim Whistler, our treasurer, and Lorena Hernan, Dorothy Welch, and the Mattel sisters, Rick Kruger, Wendy Hook, and 
Lisa Fowler, who introduces here, and Steph, uh, Eric, and our youngest new great techno guy, Ian Baxter. He's at St. Olaf, and boy, he's very helpful. The next step of researching and writing would be more difficult because of the funds it would take to hire a professional writer. Since we had just been successful acquiring three minute pocket historical, or three grants, legacy grants from the Minnesota Historical Society for inventorying our Minnetonka Historical Society artifacts, getting them online so that you can see everything in the house and look at it from all sides and see information about each object. Uh, we at the Minnetonka Historical Society wanted to make sure that we get the surviving Freer family involved and on board with the project. And here is Graham Stanton Freer. So he, he passed in 2014, but um, I had to do some internet sleuth work because we didn't know any of the living family. But I came upon the obituary for Graham Freer uh, at St. Olaf. And it said, survived by son Jonathan Freer, daughter Christine King, pictured here with him, and granddaughter Jennifer King. And I could only find Jennifer King because of social media. She was the youngest one. And uh, I was able to find a, con a contact for her, and we exchanged emails about her project, and they were very pleased that we were going ahead with this finally. And so here's uh, Christine King in 2014 with her father, Graham Stanfreer, at a memorial for his great-grandfather, Dudley Pike Chase, a Civil War hero. So the Minnetonka Historical Society applied for the grant in July this summer, and we were fortunate enough to get it approved in September 2021, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, for $10,000. Thank you, Minnesota Historical Society. Next uh, thing to do was to cho choose a writer, and we chose Kurt Brown, the great Minnesota history author, to research and write the manuscript. And we are fortunate enough that he has accepted the challenge. He's very uh, excited about it because his wife is from Minnetonka. He's, he knew some things about uh Minnetonka already, and so we're fortunate that he has accepted the challenge. Here are Kurt Brown's six books on Amazon. Uh, the recent one about the influenza in 1918 in Minnesota, Storm, Frozen History, and the Steps of Little Crow was, I think, 13th on the New York Times uh, list. Uh, was, uh, 15 years ago or so, where he talked about the Little Crow and his role in the 1862 uprising. And uh, then William Gary's company, and then a uh, uh, story about Split, uh, Split Rock, uh, the keeper at Split Rock from his manuscripts. So he's had experience doing this from taking manuscripts and then uh, making a story out of them. Um, and coincidentally, last Sunday, just a couple days ago, I emailed Dana's granddaughter, Christine Freer, that Kurt Brown is the writer, and she wrote back that the family is very pleased. On the same day, I'm Googling Dudley Pike Chase, the Civil War hero, who is Dana's grandpa, and what do I get but a 2012 Star and Tribune article about him written by none other than Kurt Brown. So then I emailed Kurt yesterday and last night he said, yeah, I had forgotten. I didn't make the connection that that was Freer's because, uh, you know, it's his grandson, Dan Freer. Uh, but he remembers writing the article and meeting uh, Graham Freer, his son, and Christine King, his granddaughter. So what a small world that Dana's grandfather and his granddaughter uh, meet with the internet. So 
just a few. So, just a few uh, excerpts from the book. Uh, some of the interesting, compelling stories. Uh, the trapper's cabin that was moved to in Wyzetta to the uh, to the park over on the west side of the city, and that park uh, it was moved from from Bushaway Road. And I think in his book we found evidence for the name of the possible name of the. Uh, man who built it and the year 1852, but it isn't confirmed yet. But at least here's the quote from the book. There is no record that McAlpin or Bourgeois preempted any land where they first settled in 1852 on the east shore of Wyzetta Bay, although they built shanties on the spot known as Bourgeois Mound and later Bushaway, you know, over by uh, Grays Bay, that bridge and where 101 is. That uh, peninsula is called Bushaway today. In the spring of 1853, they moved into the growing village of Minnetonka, where Bourgeois built the first blacksmith shop west of St. Anthony. The name Bushaway for the peninsula between Grays Bay and Wyzetta Bay, the land along the east side of Wyzetta Bay, is a corruption of Bourgeois, a French name which was too hard for the Yankee settlers, so it soon became Bushaway. He had a name for it, Bourgeois. But uh, according to the map that should have been up there, you can kind of see it wasn't quite lined up. So uh, they aren't for sure that that is the name. So they still don't really know who built it. This is my favorite story uh, from Dana's manuscript. This one could be in a, in a movie, I think, or something. Settlers came to Minnetonka Township first in 1852 at what is now Minnetonka Mills and occupied lands of their choice by squatters' rights on or near the banks of Minnehaha Creek, where the sawmill was built that year. Ownership of lands did not occur until they were surveyed and placed on sale in 1855. Squatting on land consisted in staking out the area wanted building and occupying a shanty or house on it and preparing to cultivate the land. If a man left his land unoccupied for only a short time, a few hours or more, someone was likely to jump his claim and take possession. There appears to have been little claim jumping at Minnetonka. James Rooney, though, um, who afterwards settled in Minnetonka, took his first claim shanty here in Plymouth Township. So one day he returned from Minneapolis to find that three men had jumped part of his claim. Without their seeing him, he went to his cabin and secured his gun and revolver, and then putting a bottle to represent liquor in his pocket, he walked out near the claim jumpers. He pretended to take a few drinks from the bottle as though he's drunk, leveled his shotgun at the men and ordered them to get off his claim. They left at once and returned to Minneapolis. I had never heard of that ruse where you pretend you're drunk if you're outnumbered and just, well, you got a swinging shotgun at you, you're trying to run. And so they left at once and returned to Minneapolis. Here, they, the three men secured guns and some liquor and started back to the claim. One man drank so much liquor on the way back that he shot off his arm. This ended the claim jumping. That's the last sentence. So I'm looking forward to Kurt Brown taking a story just a little bit like that, turning, you know, seeing what he could do with it. And this is uh, kind of a tragic story. The Stone family drowned. Uh, Frank Butterfield lived with his parents in a house which stood south of the town hall on Baker Road, and he worked in the sawmill on the creek on the night of October 18, 1859. So in the fall, kind of late, right around now, uh, Frank's father, Nathaniel Butterfield, 
also worked in the mill, was helping move the Morton Stone family from Haynes Bay, Lake Minnetonka, to Minnetonka Mills in a sailboat. In the boat, besides Butterfield, were Stone, his wife and two children, Mr. Loveland and Robert McKenzie. The boat, which was loaded with household goods besides the seven persons, was capsized by the wind opposite Orono Point. For a while, Mrs. Mrs. Stone and the two children kept afloat on a feather bed, which soon collapsed, drowning them. The men clung to the boat until the wind turned it over when Mr. Stone perished. Butterfield and Loveland, benumbed and exhausted, followed him before morning. Mackenzie, a youth of 18, clung to the boat, which by morning, about 10 o'clock, had drifted across the lake. Mackenzie finally managed to swim and wade ashore and make his way to Bartow's home. None of the bodies of those drowned was found until many days later when the body of Butterfield washed ashore in Browns Bay. So here's you know, interesting stories of the struggle to live as a pioneer and I'm glad I'm not going to be lost. Here's one of my favorite pictures. Lake Minnetonka was a beautiful, pristine lake in the 19th century. Here's one of my favorite pictures. Lake Minnetonka was a beautiful, pristine lake in the 19th century. The old growth trees were cut down in the 1850s when they could simply float the huge tree trunks down Minnehaha Creek to the new lumber mill at Minnetonka Mills. Many people enjoyed family picnics in its shores in the summertime, like here in this photo. And here's some more excerpts kind of about that. Uh, most early, quote, most early traveling was on foot or horseback or stagecoach, and in some cases by rowboat or canoe on the creek below the dam, and later by steamboat above the dam and on the lake. Buggies or wagons could not be used above the dam because there, there were few trails that were wide enough. Here are the Burwells in the late 1870s in the excursion from Minnetonka Mills to Wyzetta via the Minnehaha Creek on the steamboat Fresco. I think this picture is actually in Wyzetta where they ended and then they go back through Grays Bay and down the creek. A few shallow draft boats, quote, uh, moved freely up and down the creek carrying free freight, mail, and passengers. Along the creek were many fine swimming holes and fishing places. In the early days, the hotels at Minnetonka Mills did a thriving tourist business with people from the Twin Cities and the South. Visitors to the lake often drove wagons to Minnetonka Mills where they continued the journey by steamboat. There were no railroads to the lake before 1867 in Wyzetta and 1881 in Excelsior. In 1880, one, the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad was built through Hopkins and Minnetonka Mills out to Hutchinson, making three stops a day at the station called Minnetonka. In 1886, the city of Minnetonka changed the railroad tracks uh, in, into the bike path that we enjoy today. Um, this is an unknown family, but I just wanted to, but it's from the same time. We'd like to identify that. Uh, trained in the 1800s. And an old map showing uh, the route from Minneapolis on the railroad through St. Louis Park, a little town, and Hopkins, the uh, next little town, and then Minnetonka Mills to Wyzetta. And this is um, Minneapolis in 1867. And so uh, after going out, outgoing train left Hopkins, the brakemen, so imagine these guys have come up from the south, which many did uh, in the summertime, to go on vacation in beautiful Lake Minnetonka uh, because they didn't have air conditioning back then is one of the main reasons. And so they came up in, on the uh, steamboat, and then they would get on the train later here coming in to, first to Hopkins. And then uh, the brakemen would announce that the next stop is Minnetonka. So everybody, occasionally, everybody, uh, or occasionally a number of people unacquainted with the area would get off the train at Minnetonka 
thinking that they were in their destination at Lake Minnetonka. Too late, they would discover their mistake after the train had pulled out looking for, and this is the view they would have. They pull up to the mill office and there's Charles Burwell there. Uh, before it was moved to its present location next door to the Burwell House across the creek. But when they got off the, the railroad track, they looked at this and they could see the windmill and his house. So they went over there to talk to him. And um, so they would look for someone to drive them onto their destination in Wyzetta or Excelsior. And um, this... Uh, and so Mr. Bill Burwell, the mill manager, soon tired of acting as emergency taxi driver for the stranded tourists. And here's a really good map. Of, he asked the railroad to add the words mills to the station name. So that's how it became Minnetonka Mills. This they did, and the station became Minnetonka Mills from that point on. Constant use and its inclusion on maps and in literature and timetables was fixed the name definitely to the area now designated by it, unquote. And here's Charles Burwell and just a generic picture of, you know, the whole family getting on a buckboard back then driven by a horse or two. And they would have to go from Mentonka Mills right about here all the way to Wyzetta. It probably took a few hours depending on the weather. And so that's how it got the name. There was ample reason for addition of the word mills because at that time there was a large operating flour mill at the place. The name by common usage was come to. There was ample reason for addition of the word mills because at that time there was a large operating flour mill at the place. The name by common usage was come to include the adjacent community. Uh, here you can see Dana's notes on one of the hundreds of photographs he's collected in his, for his book. So here is a painting by Seth Eastman of the Dakota Lodge on the Minnesota River and the photo of Chief Shakopee. So the uh, trail, the Native American trail, went from Mille Lacs down to Shakopee and went right through the center of Minnetonka Mills all the way up until the 18, uh, 1851 when they lost all the land and were forced to go to, uh, to live on the Minnesota River after the Treaty of Traverse to Sioux in 1851. Uh, but, uh, and then it's, this quote is from uh, the Tribune article. Mr. Freer can sit for hours in the living room of his family home uh, and re reel off facts about Minnetonka. Quote, this was a real manufacturing t community when it started, he says with pride in his eye. A sawmill and a dam were built down on the creek in the summer of 54 and was rebuilt as a furniture factory. That factory in the wilderness turned out chairs, dressers, beds, and other furnishings, while the Dakota and the Ojibwe Native Americans passed by the door on an Indian trail that brought them to the battlegrounds between Anoka and the Mississippi River. The Dakota Indians under Chief Shakopee often visited the lake and its environs to hunt and fish. So uh, he has this, well, uh, so the view of Minnehaha Creek west from Here's the Burwell House, and you see this dotted line. That's where he drew where the uh, in the Native American trail went, and so it went right where Bridge Street is and the Dairy Queen. And so then they would camp out between kind of where St. David's is and partially on the Freer property. So between uh, Freer's house and Freer's store, the Native Americans camped out in the 1850s, and he has an eyewitness uh, story about that. There's a picture of Jenny Pratt, who's 98 years old in 1945, and she's telling the story about when she came to uh, Minnetonka, and let's see, that would be uh, 
1847. And so this event happened at uh, 1850s or so, when she's only about eight years old or so. So it's the Indian victory dance. So one afternoon in 1855, a large party of Dakota Indians approached the village from the north where they had a battle with the Ojibwe's. So they had just won this battle up north. And Dana Freer says, we will let Jenny Atwood Pratt tell the story about what she told me. So, quote, in 1945, she's talking. At the creek, we're much more, uh, we were much more conscious of the Indians as their trail between Anoka and Shakopee crossed the creek at Minnetonka Mills in front of the varnish shop. And it seemed that they were always going back and forth. I should say her house, the Atwood house, is where St. David's is now. So they must have had a battle with the Ojibwe and up north, and they had wounded men and even squaws, as well as many scalps. We children, Jenny, that's the, the talker, uh, and her sisters Ella and Emma, were outdoors as little kids and ran screaming to the house. But only our timid mother and grandmother were there. By the way, their father died, drowned in the creek. He worked at the mill. So tragically, she had to raise her four daughters. The Sioux, or the Dakota, we call them now, uh, camped just above the house on the hill where, uh, where Dana Freer lives. And at night, they had their scalp dance. I was only seven years old, but I shall never forget the awful night of those scalps and the hollering and the hooping as they danced. They were painted one side of the face yellow and the other side green. And uh, my mother tried to help some of the wounded by taking them some hot soup, but it didn't seem to do much to ease their suffering. Then Tom Robson, a boy who lived in the next house south of the town hall, went over to visit this Indian camp he started to annoy a young Indian brave who took af off after him. Tom ran across the footbridge over the creek in front of the Atwood house towards home with the Indian close behind. He was scared, and when he reached his home, he didn't stop to open the door, but just he jumped headfirst through the open, unscreened window. The Indian laughed and went back to camp. So another firsthand story and that's a good place to end uh thank you just to <laughs> thank you